Hi, this is Nancy Fudge, and I'm here to talk about the father of American forestry, uh, Joseph Trimble Rothrock. He was born in Pennsylvania in 1839, and he was not a healthy child, so his mother encouraged him to get out and experience nature and walk a lot, so he walked a lot and it helped him heal. And so that started his love of the woods. And his mother was a botanist, so he wanted to be a botanist, uh, but that before he could be one, he became a soldier in 1863. He joined the Civil War and, and he was an infantry and he was wounded in the Battle of Fredericksburg. But it was kind of advantageous because at the hospital, he met and shook hands with President Lincoln that made him very uh, patriotic and Later on, he rejoined this, after he healed, he rejoined uh, the Civil War as a captain in charge of a cavalry unit. And when he got out, he went to Harvard and he stuttered, studied under Asa Gray, a famous uh, botanist and explorer. And he kind of, that was his idols. He wanted to be an explorer and a botanist. And uh, so he was, the same year he, he started Harvard, in 1864 he was asked to go survey alaska and this alaska survey is where he learned his skills at surveying and looking at botany and describing trees and forests and it was said that his survey of alaska is what made america the united states want to purchase alaska and then later on he went to the university of pennsylvania and he stud, studied medicine so he was a, a surgeon and a botanist and uh, that's also where he did a lot of exercise and he went uh, and became a surgeon in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. But even there, he would get out and he'd walk in the woods and he really loved nature. But here was the problem. Uh, he would tell people to go walk in nature, but all the trees were gone in the area of Wilkesbury. And when he was young, the trees, he said, you could find trees common that were six feet in diameter. And now, well, then it was even hard to find a single tree. He couldn't, they couldn't walk in nature if there were no trees. And um, so in 1873, he, as a doctor, he went to become a surgeon and a botanist on another Smithsonian expedition to look at the 100th parallel, I'm uh, sorry, the west of the 100th parallel. And it's there he started studying trees and the importance of them in Pennsylvania. So he returned to Pennsylvania and he was give and he became a professor in 1876 of botany at University of Pennsylvania. And he also in 1880, um, or sorry, in 1877, he got a grant to um, by this, this Michon was a French botanist who had come to America and he offered $15,000 upon his death to anyone to help encourage forestry in Pennsylvania and rejuvenate the forests that had been lost. And he won this grant. So he went around doing these lectures on forestry and what he had learned. And in 1880, he realized he didn't know as much as he thought. And he took a nine month sabbatical from teaching to go and learn forestry in Germany. And he said, these people, places in Germany, they've had forests for hundreds of years. And when they're forest, they use up their forest, but they replant. And so it's always perpetual. Where in America, we weren't perpetuating the forests and they were dying. And he called uh, Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania desert, because there was, there was no trees where once tall trees had stood. And without the trees, the soil was eroded. Without trees, the, the temperature plummeted and ice formed and, and the groundwater, um, well, the ground froze and the water was not able to saturate and the water table went down. And so all sorts of bad things were happening. And so in 1886, a Mary Scott Lundy and a Mary Middleton Fisher Cox were two women. They saw him doing their, his lecture series and they asked him to come because they were women and they were disenfranchised to become the president of their new Pennsylvania Forest Association to help bring education of American forests. And so he became the president and that led him to an 1893 uh, through 1895, Pennsylvania asked him and another man, a William Shunk, to go and survey Pennsylvania and decide what's, what we could, they could do about the forests. And so they were, they, it was worse than what they thought. Um, they found over 4,700 miles of devastated 
wasteland that had once been highly forested. And then in uh, addition to that, they found 4,000 acres of farmland, sorry, my, these are miles, not acres, 4,000, 7,000 miles of devastation, 4,000 miles of abandoned farmland of people who could not uh, stay on their farmland anymore. 50% of uh, the county, 50% of the counties uh, had no forest at all, uh, or sorry, fi <laughs> the counties had 50% of their forests, and 20, and some counties had less than 20% of their forests. And when they say forests, they weren't even counting forests; they were just counting clumps of trees. And so he and his surveyor they decided that they needed six things, and they gave it. They told the Pennsylvania legislature, and they passed a forestry a new forestry commission under the Department of Agriculture. And later, Rothrock had it be just forestry, and he was the commissioner, and they did six things. One, planted nurseries. They planted, uh, there was no nurseries being planted for the trees that were devastated, and not a single nursery had been planted in the 200 years of forestry. And so they wanted to plant nurseries, and they wanted to use industry to help pay for the um, the new changes. And this was different than in the other states. In the other states, they would kick out their logging companies. But Pennsylvania, they said, he's, Rothrock said, no, we need these forestry and logging industries here. These people are industrious, we need them. And so they said, hey, to these forest, these logging companies, you will have no forests if you don't replant. And so he convinced them to help donate land and to help pay for the conservation program, and they did. And to also help them out, he said, uh, he, he noticed that one of the problems was taxation. Land, they would buy, pay for an acre, 10 cents, but the taxes for the year were $2.22, over 200% in taxes. So after they would log, they didn't need the land anymore, but they couldn't sell it, and the taxes were too high, so they just abandoned it. So good land that he could plant nurseries on, he couldn't get because he couldn't get, find people who owned the land. So, um, he had this tax incentive and for people who would plant a certain number of trees and would tend these trees, they would get a 90 to 80%, sorry, 80 to 90% tax cut. And so he went around, talked to the industries. They thought this was great. And so they would give him land at a cheaper price for these nurseries. They would supply people for them. They would uh, give them free land for him to do the trees on. They would and so the industry, the basically the logging industry, helped uh, early Pennsylvania conservation here. But the other problem was um, fires. With the logging industry helping them out and the purchases, they, they gained 600,000 acres of nursery lands that they could start as forest reserves. But 300,000 acres burned up every year in forest fires. <gasps> ah! So they talked to the legislature about turning many of constables into forest wardens or fire wardens. And my, my grandfather was a fire warden slash constable in the Allegheny Mountains. So this was very important with my family. And then he realized that uh, there was only forester, the only, there's only a couple foresters in all of Pennsylvania. And he wasn't, did not even consider himself a forester. So he started what's called the Mount Alto School of Forestry. It was the third forestry school in the United States. And in this school, it produced many of the foresters, the first African-American forester, the first female forester in the Mount Alto School. And he retired from the forestry department um, in 1903, uh, but he did not, head up the Mount Alto School. He gave it to one of his disciples, uh, a Professor Wart, where, who took over and led the forestry department there. But he did move to Mount Alto and start a sanatorium. He felt that health, the health benefits of forests could help heal people. And they worked and he proved it to be true. And so his sanatorium was taken over by the health department of Pennsylvania in 1907. And now Rothrock's philosophy dominated uh, Pennsylvania forestry for the next 20 years until in 1920, the chief, uh, the chief officer over the United States forestry retired and came and became um, Pennsylvania's new chief of forestry. And then a couple years after that, uh, that chief forester, uh, Gifford Pinchot, 
he became the governor and the forester was the, it was the first trained American trained forester was our governor and uh, Rothrock passed under his administration June 2nd 1922 at the age of 83 and Pinchot was so impressed with Rothrock's work he called him the father of American sorry the father of Pennsylvania forestry and he put a plaque in the rotunda there's only four plaques in the rotunda and Rothrock's is one of them of uh, Rothrock and I'm just going to give you a quote to end this this is Rothrock's own words he said in in um, 1915 the car is going to come by I'm just going to move he said hold on he said we must understand that the land is ours to use to enjoy and to transmit but that it is not ours to decimate and we are bound to leave it as good as condition a good sorry as good condition for those who follow us as we found for ourselves and again joseph trimble rothrock the father of pennsylvania forestry